Are you familiar with the ART second seat curse meme? And do you believe it holds any truth or is it purely speculative conjecture? Well, Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and this week it's a big chow as we had not one, not two, but three Feeder Series racing in Italy. And what a weekend it was. Freca finally got underway, Formula 3 had two crazy last lap crashes, and Formula 2 has a new championship leader. There's so much to go through and I couldn't do it alone. So I'm delighted to say we have a couple of drivers who are no doubt feasting on pizza over the weekend in Imola and Monza to help me. First, let me introduce someone who scored their first ever Formula 2 points on Sunday. The first Freck champion, Mercedes junior team member and ART F2 driver, Frederick Vesti. How are you today? Thank you very much. Well, I'm very good. Uh, I've just arrived home uh, to the UK where I live now. Uh, we've just done the third round of Formula 2 in Imola and uh, yeah, it was a really good weekend. It was my first points and uh, a lot of hard work has been going on uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, it's, no, it's no doubt that this season hasn't started the way I wanted, uh, but to have a really positive uh, Saturday and Sunday in Imola was uh, really important to me. Yeah, I can't imagine. I can't wait to go through all the Formula 2 stuff with you and everybody else here. And speaking of everybody else here, we've got the Formula Regional Asia 2021 Vice Champion and the 2021 F3 Driver, and now a Driver Coach, Pierre-Louis Chauvet, straight from Imla. How are you doing today? Fine, thanks. Uh, thank you. So, straight from Monza, yeah, I should I, say. Not straight from Monza. Monza yeah, from I've Monza. Been, exactly. Last weekend, I was in Monza uh, for the Freca Championship, the start of it. Um, yeah, and it went pretty well for the for the team. I was inside Prema. And uh, yeah, it was a really nice weekend. So let's talk about it uh, later. Yeah, I can't wait to go through it. And last, but very much not least, back to the podcast to help me navigate a very busy weekend of racing. It's the welcome return of F1 Feeder Series F2 editor, Tyler Foster. Have your eyes recovered from an awful lot of racing this weekend? There's no need for a recovery. Racing's lovely. You know, it's still turning back. Um, you know, and so a guy that actually was there in Imola, in Frederick, um, you know, I've spoken to him in press conferences, but not actually had the opportunity to, to have that you know, one-to-one sort of feel. So that'd be nice to, to see how Frederick you know, thought the weekend went from a inside the cockpit perspective. And then um, Chauvet was supposed to be with us a few weeks ago, I, I believe. So it's good to have him here. And he's someone who, you know, he's been about, he knows things. So I'm sure they'll have more to say than I will on anything. But yeah, I'm here if, uh, if you need that. So. <laughs> Just the backup. Uh, yeah. There is one last introduction I need to make, and that's to welcome in another year for F1 Feeder Series founder, Floris Visman, who celebrates his birthday this week. I've been reliably told he's turning 18, but I have been told that for the last few years as well. Whatever his age, we're all wishing you a very happy birthday, Floris. Now, before we get into it, a quick reminder to like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening to the audio-only version, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're using. It really does help us out. So F2 headed for Imola for the first time in about 15 years. Uh, What the teams and drivers needed was a lot of practice, but instead they got three red flags in practice, a wet qualifying. How tough was it out there on Friday? It looked like you might not have had got... It looked like you might not have even had that much uh, action for qualifying to start with. Fred, you were stuck in the pit lane. Yeah, to be honest, Friday was not my day. Uh, obviously, we we started in, in Friday with practice, which was uh, delayed due to heavy rain, uh, starting around the time our FP was supposed uh, was supposed to to be started. So it was delayed. Um, we went to lunch instead, uh, which is obviously not the ideal. Uh, start to the Friday. Hey, in Italy, lunch is a big deal. Yeah, true. But luckily, the, the weather cleared up uh, a bit later in the afternoon, and we was able to do FP and qualifying uh, on Friday. In uh, FP, I actually only got one lap uh, push lap because it was out, push, red flag, 
uh, three times um, and we were betting some tires for late in the weekend and so on at AT. So we just, it uh, was a bit late uh, and every time we got out, it was just a red flag. Um, and in qualifying, I, I had a battery failure, which was uh, very, very bad, you know, for, for the preparation, only having done one push up in, quali- in FP going into quali and then missing uh, almost the first run of qualifying. Uh, but yeah, Imola is a lovely track, so I definitely enjoyed it. Apart from all the rain, it's a very lovely place. It looked like it was, yeah. it's a proper driver's track, isn't it? It's like an absolute classic F1 venue, even though passing seems to be quite difficult. But I don't know how you guys coped after such little running on uh, on the Friday. So you say there's a battery issue in qualifying? Yeah, so on the pre-grid, they, they just started perfectly. Um, I went to, to the pit lane, F1 pit lane, where when the green flag goes, everyone starts the engine and drives onto the circuit. And um, yeah, we were trying to start the engine and there was just no battery. The, the engine just didn't fire. Um, and obviously it's the worst situation you could be in as a driver and as a team. You've done everything to prepare um, the car and, and the weekend. And then for qualifying, the car's not starting. Uh, but ART was very quickly to, to solve the issue. I think I was back on track after eight minutes. A maximum is 10 minutes of, of qualifying. Um, so it wasn't ideal, but it definitely didn't. Uh, changed the weekend upside down which was lucky yeah very lucky as well i mean <laughs> the amount of issues that we saw drivers falling off the track and so on it's good that you got one one or two laps out there on friday so you knew how to race it now tyler marcus armstrong and theo porcher took wins porcher now the championship leader vips got his first pole scored no points after that and Nissani led the feature race and he got no silverware Typical F2 weekend, I guess you could call it. How did the weekend unfold, in your opinion? I, I think it has a lot to do with Imola uh, as a track. And, you know, Fred just spoke about it, you know, the difficulty with the, with the lack of running and all that. But having those historic tracks where you've got gravel and then grass rather than, you know, even you know, a few inches of runoff makes just that much of a difference. And we saw that with so many drivers, you know, making those, those mistakes. And yes, the, the, the circumstances in terms of the running would have affected that. But I think that um, that it shows just how competitive it is, even when you're in Sani's position where you know, he was leading the race. Um, you know, technically, I know that there were some drivers that hadn't pitted yet, but he, in terms of um, where he was on the track, he had the lead and he binned it for you know no foreseeable reason other than he just went a bit wide. And, and the Vips one was another really weird one where um, you know just a couple of inches onto the onto the gravel and you're gone. Um, so it meant that the people that were patient, the people that were, you know, showing that car control, they were the ones this weekend that really got the, um, the reward. And, um, and Fred, you know, being one of those drivers this weekend, you know, kept himself out of trouble. So it opened the championship up a lot because, you know, Paul Cher, who's effectively only finished two races really this, this season, um, you know, he's won both the feature races. So at this rate, he's just going to win the feature races and that'll be the championship. But, um, yeah, so it was really exciting because uh, Imola is a, a really good circuit. And for the F2 and F3, it was I think it was more exciting than the F1, in my opinion. But I kind of always feel that way. But, um, but yeah, it was really good. Yeah, I, it's an interesting point. I haven't really considered the fact of the lack of runoff, so to speak, compared to the tracks we've been at. I know Jed is quite a tight, twisty track. But do you think that's something, Tyler, that, that maybe the F2 drivers like Nisani, who should have the experience for it, just have got so used to being at Bahrain, being to these places where you can have this tarmac gravel, a tarmac runoff with no gravel, unlike Imola, that it's just something that those slight mistakes might have happened before, we just didn't see them so visible. I don't think it's so much getting used to other tracks. I think it's just when you're in that position, especially you know, looking to lead a race, and you're trying to find every single tent. You know, we saw it with Charles in, F- in uh, the F1 race, you know, mm. so, little reason and you know, people will have a go at him for doing something he didn't need to do he pushed that bit harder and ended up making mistakes signs in qualifying as well exactly so it's not a specific thing um but i was surprised how much it happened because you rarely do see a con- you know um, consecutive drivers making what seem like really simple mistakes but i think it just illustrates especially for f2 and f3 without you know, power steering and those sort of things just how hard it is for for guys like frederick to do that job so, you know, for those who did it and for those who reap the rewards, fair play and well done. Yeah, well done indeed, uh, Fred. It's <laughs> two finishes. I've talked to all these people who were 
crashing out. Two finishes, middle of the pack few in the sprint race, although you did have a great move on Duan. And then a solid P6 in the feature race with you benefiting from those early safety cars. Good weekend in your eyes? I would say it's definitely been an improvement in terms of Bahrain, Jeddah, and then Imola. Um, for sure, it's been my best weekend so far in Formula 2. Um, so I was definitely leaving Imola with a smile, uh, but I'm nowhere um, compared to where I know I can be and where I want to be in the Formula 2 grid so far. And it's mainly been qualifying this year. Um, in testing and even in the race runs I've done in the races, feature race in, in, uh, in Imola, and the sprint races um, that I've done so far, the pace has been really strong. Um, the tire, manage tire management is good. All these things are, are quite on point, um, but qualifying just haven't been there. And as you guys know, when if you don't start uh, top 10, at least in the Formula 2 race, it can be very difficult to move forward. Imola showed something else uh, because strategy was very important and uh, the early safety cars definitely mixed up the grid very much. Yeah, really, really fortunate for um, those drivers who were running that strategy and very unlucky for, for the other ones. Now, a driver who had, a, well, I wouldn't say even a bit, it's just more bad luck in the feature race was your old teammate, Pierre, Dennis Hauger, got his first silverware on Saturday, in F2 that is, he's got quite a lot of silverware from F3, but more bad luck after a collision with Dewan on Sunday. Do you think Formula 2 is a bigger challenge than Dennis might have expected? I don't think so. That was a pure, um, let's say, race incident, I think. Uh, it was uh, He was unlucky, basically. Um, but yeah, I think uh, he's facing, a, let's say, a high-level grid. So, of course, uh, he's doing sometimes P6, P4 in quali. And uh, he's doing well, but uh, he's not uh, dominating like he was in F in F three. So, of course, um, he's facing uh, um, yeah some great drivers. So um, yeah, let's see what happens uh, for the rest of the year. But um, for the moment, uh, he's improving, improving uh, race by race. Well, you've just spent the weekend with Prema, and Fred, you obviously know Prema very well as well. This year, they haven't dominated in Formula 2, Pierre, as much as we've seen previously, but they did have a much improved Saturday with double podium. Are you thinking it's everybody else has stepped up, or are you thinking potentially the driver pairing this year isn't necessarily as strong as it has been in previous years? No, no, I think the, the driver pair is, uh, is strong, but the whole field is strong. Basically, now we see Dams drivers like uh, Nissani or Iwaza, for example, he was at P2 in quali, mm. so Dams are back. Uh, ART are doing well, uh, like Fred or uh, RTO. Um, uh, Uni Virtuosi with the pole position of uh, Jack in Bahrain. So, you know, you have MP, of course, with uh, Drogovic, uh, with the feature race win um, in Jeddah. So, of course, the field is really strong. And I don't think, uh, let's say, they lost uh, something in the team. Uh, it's just that the other teams are stronger. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, just a quick one on you. Because you mentioned Drogovic there. We talk about consistency. He's the only driver that scored points every single round, but he has lost the championship lead. Will he be encouraged or discouraged from this weekend, do you think? I don't think he should be. I don't think he should be too discouraged, um, and I don't think he is. I think he's more disappointed on his own performance rather than the fact that he's lost the championship lead. I think I've got to be honest. I've, I spoke to nearly every single driver on the grid about this, and nobody who is um, even guys like Duan, who you know has had a pole position but is really far down the standings, he's not worried about the championship at all. At, at this point in the season, it's not something to worry about. It's not something to focus on, and especially someone who in Drogovic isn't a driver who I don't think would have been expecting um, to fight for the title as early in the season as he was. It's really not a good idea to focus on that. And I think the fact that um, the, the both races were quite chaotic and hectic and everything, it's one of those weekends you just got to chalk down to experience and then just go again. Um, you know, Chauvet mentioned about guys like Owasa being in Peter, in Peter and Qualif. Uh, so it was a bit topsy-turvy, things weren't normal. Um, but uh, the fact that he's still second and the fact that, you know, you mentioned the consistency is key. Uh, in F3, we'll talk about that a bit later, you know, about that consistency with the drivers. But um, I think that in regards to Prema, the driving lineup might be slightly 
uh, less strong than it was last year, but it still is strong. But I think the thing to remember about Hauga is that he won his uh, F3 title in his second year. So I think that next year will be strong. I think this year will be similar to how maybe Leclerc was in F3 last year. I think he'll have a strong season, but he won't be uh, top three, top five. The Daruvala, I think he'll be a driver that might only win one race and it might only be like a sprint race this year. But he, I reckon he's someone to watch for the title purely based on that consistency. And, and that's the thing that's really key at this level. So yeah, Drogovic, if you can keep that going, certainly a championship contender. Let's move on to Formula 3. <laughs> what a weekend. They were, the, they were the standout races, I thought. Two wild races saw Colette and Hajar crash on Saturday um, from podium positions. Then Behrman and Saucy collide on Sunday. Now, you've got connection with Gregoire Saucy, of course, Fred, just with ART. Did you see him after the race? Um, I didn't actually see Gregor after the race, but I was uh, on the phone with him texting after after the weekend, just a, a bit of a, a debrief as a friend. And how did that debrief go? Well, obviously, it's very disappointing. Uh, he was in a position where the podium was within reach for him. Um, and he did what any driver should do and would do uh, and going for the move. And it's just one of those things where if the driver on the inside doesn't give space, it will end up in a crash. Um, and, and, and that's it. There's no more, no more to say, I think. Uh, it's really disappointing for him. Uh, but he has a long season ahead of him and he just needs to bounce back as quickly as possible. Now, you're obviously on the race weekend with Formula 3, not on at the same time, but you've got your own prep going on. Did you get a chance to watch the full races, some of the races? Do we watch it just in yeah, the background? So- yeah, I always try to watch the races, um, even the yeah, they have three, they have one qualifying practice as much as possible um, because, you know, they have similar racing lines than us. They experience similar things um, that we do in Formula 2. So to to watch the Formula 3 is, is a good benefit for me. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely following it and, uh, and looking out for potential overtaking uh, places, uh, different lines from different drivers and so on. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> Not much you can do from your practice. You can watch everybody else's performances. Yeah. Uh, we've got to do a quick shout out to a previous F1 Feeder Series podcast guest, uh, Colin Pinto, taking his first win. Tremendous stuff, that. Roman Stanek as well, who picked up after uh, Zay Maloney span his car under the safety car. How difficult, Pierre, is it to warm the tyres up in these cool conditions that we saw? You raced in F3 last year at quite a wet Paul Ricard, uh, where temperatures were obviously rock bottom. Maloney span under his own accord trying to do a restart where you've dropped the tyre temperature from going slow behind the safety car, plus you've coupled that with lower track temperatures anyway. Was it something that Maloney's inexperience might have struggled with? Or do you think just having cold tyres on that car is really difficult to manage for anybody? I think it's something difficult to manage anyway. But from what I saw, uh, she was maybe a bit too nervous uh, because I rewatched the race afterwards. Um, and maybe she was a bit too nervous uh, just for the restart and uh, let's say that the steering uh, inputs were a bit too aggressive, I think. And she just uh, spun on the, on the throttle application, basically. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a mistake uh, that you do when you start Formula 3 because, of course, uh, yeah, the, tires, uh, man- the tire management is really, really tricky, really difficult. And uh, I think uh, she got surprised, basically, by the, the tire temp. Yeah, the driving that car in the wet was obviously a struggle for everybody. You had to do it almost at the last minute last year with the, it was um, Laszlo Tote, I think, was it? Had COVID and you jumped in in the car. How difficult is it under, how difficult is it with the rain? I mean, um, the car the car is as heavy, basically, as the regional. Uh, let's say when you are in, in the car, it feels the same, but you have ob- obviously way more downforce and way more power. So, yeah, I mean, the, the traction uh, uh, management is, uh, is different. And uh, you also have throttle maps to help you in FIF3 compared to, to regional or F4. 
so that's a bit easier but uh, still uh, for example uh, high speed corners you need to take advantage of the of the downforce and this is something uh, you have to experience and you have to feel but uh, it is really yeah um, technical I wish you were out there, PLC. Uh, you've got a lot of fans from what we can see from the questions that have come in. Uh, Tyler, Victor Martins, Leclerc now joint in the standings at the top. Arthur, without even taking a win, like similar to what you said actually about Daruvala, that just a consistency. Any predictions for how the season's going to play out now we've got two rounds under our belt? Well, if I had to put money on it, and I don't like to, but if I did, I'd have to go with Leclerc based on the fact that um, I covered him in the winter series in uh, Formula Regional Asia. Mm-hmm. And he did a very similar thing. Of course, he was winning in, in that competition because the, the quality of driving was, was slightly lower than this. But, but he did a similar thing in terms of that consistency. And it is horrible because you do want your champions and your winners to be, you know, like Piastri was last year in F2, where they dominate and pick up poles every other round and, and win races. But sometimes it's more important to, to focus on just taking those positions. And that's kind of what Leclerc has been doing. Um, Martins is a driver who, you know, on his day is probably up there in terms of top three drivers on the grid, pace, consistency. Um, but the problem is, is that it's where the feature races are. And as we found out in uh, on, on Sunday, if you don't get it right in the feature races, then, you know, it doesn't matter. And that's why Maloney's down in ninth and Martins and Leclerc are up in first and second, despite not having poles. So... I think that when it comes down to it, Leclerc is someone who's practiced that consistency. He's had that year last year. He's had the winter series. Um, It's difficult because of the fact that with F3, there's such a large grid that there's always unknown talents. Uh, You know, Colapinto is someone who obviously when we spoke to about, you know, he had that pole, he didn't get the win, but he's got a win in the sprint race. So, you know, there's so much talent on that grid. But again, if I had to put my money between Martins and Leclerc, I would go Leclerc purely on the fact that I think he's had more time to practice uh, in, in those cars. And as a result, I think that consistency will be sort of bored into him as a driver. Fred, do you want to defend uh, Martins at this point, just with the, again, the ART connection? Well, I think it's impossible to say who's going to be the champion. You know, it can even be someone else. Um, the, the main thing in Formula 2 and Formula 3 is the progression um, and the development of the driver. I mean, I had that same thing in, in Formula 3 in 2020, my first season. I didn't end up winning, but I was very, very close. Uh, this right being, I think I was 65 points down at some point, and I ended just 17 points behind Oscar. Um, and that was literally because I had such a massive improvement throughout my season. Um, so you can, never, you can never decide. We've just completed the second round of F3. Um, but yeah, let's see. It's, uh, it's definitely the consistency is key for the championship. It really is. Uh, just a quick word as well, because we've had to say goodbye to Johnny Edgar from the championship. Um, and Juan Manuel Man- Man- Correa, easy for me to say, missed out this weekend as well. Hope he's okay. Do you have any news on that at all, Fred? No, it's difficult to, to say at this point. Um, I think he's, uh, or I know that he's fighting very hard every single day to, to come back as quickly as possible. Uh, and hopefully that's already in his next uh, LMP2 race in Imola in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, I, I don't know anything on his his progress, but um, yeah, it's it's um, almost a day to day update. I think they're doing at the moment because uh, you know it's uh, yeah they want to get him back to racing as soon as possible. Now let's go into Freca. <laughs> It wasn't enough from all the action we had at Imola. We had to also race at Monza. And you were there, Pierre, for a soaking wet Saturday and a sunny Sunday. How was it on the ground? Um, let's say that um, Dino Beganovic did a really solid weekend. Um, he did P1 and P2 in quali. Um, then he won race one. He did second in race two. But uh, he was really clever, really smart in, in those races, uh, not doing any mistakes. And uh, even if the, the conditions were really tricky because there, was some, uh, there were some uh, dump patches, you know, on track uh, in the quali on Sunday morning and uh, the track wasn't fully, fully dry. For example, the second chicane was still wet. So, yeah, uh, the drivers had a pretty... <laughs> 
difficult uh, second quali and they had to adapt uh, quite quickly to these uh, track conditions. Your role there weren't driving, unfortunately, but you're as a driver coach, I understand, to Amna al Uh What does that entail and how did that relationship start? In fact, it started in Asia uh, this winter, so 2022, uh, with Khaled al Kubaisi, so his father. And um, at the end, she texted me and she said, OK, I'm, let's say, looking for a driver coach this year. And uh, I, I know you are quite experienced uh, with this car as you are vice champion in 2021 in Asia. And, um, and you know also pretty well the European tracks. So let's see how it works. And uh, we started in Barcelona, collective tests. I think it was one and a half months ago now. And uh, it went pretty well, and then we decided to move forward for the for the season. Excellent stuff. Well, I hope it leads to you getting more experience and getting your name out there as well. Love to see you back racing in single seaters. Fred Prima dominated over that weekend. Boganovic and Aaron both taking wins. What makes them such a strong team at that level? You obviously were dominant back in 2019. Yeah, so I I need to be honest. I haven't watched much of it. Uh, I did see that the, that Aron he won uh, on Sunday. Yeah, it's it's you know Prema is, is really strong. Uh, same as AT. I as I remember, AT was the champion last year in Freca, I think, uh, with with Saucy. Uh, this year, it seems at least in Monza that the Prema was strong. And uh, yeah, we'll have to to look further into the season before we can decide who is who is the most dominant team. Uh, but there's no doubt these top teams uh, that we that we're talking about here is is absolutely on the limit on everything. They have some of the best engineers in the junior world. Uh, they can easier, let's say, because they have won championships previously. They can get the better drivers, which means they have a bigger chance of winning as well. And they just do that extra little thing on the car, you know, in preparation, so it doesn't break down. Those kind of things all adds up, and in the end you know, you build the consistency like that. They do. Um, Pierre, just a one last thing on your side that we saw, as you'd expect in Freca, a lot of safety cars. One came when Amna hit uh, Armani at that second chicane and we saw some arguing on the pictures afterwards. Do you know what was said and how that all played out? Yeah, the second chicane, yeah. And um, let's say that it was, um, um, let's say, unlucky incident uh, one more time. Uh, she was in the pack, you know, and uh, at one point there was a yellow flag, and uh, apparently the crash, the the car that crashed into her, um, saw the red flag quite late, and instead of crashing into the car in front, she she turned on on her, and then they they have crashed like this. So it was uh, let's say uh, quite unlucky, to be honest. Yeah, unlucky stuff. It was uh, going in, well. It was both were really good races, just a lot of safety cars as you always expect in Freco and. We touched on it a little bit as well, Fred. Second winner, Paul Aaron, also a Mercedes junior team driver. How does that relationship work? Do you see him that often? And how does Mercedes help at that lower level of, of racing? Yeah, so just to, to, to start that question, I don't actually see Paul a lot. I remember he was in F4 uh, when I was doing, I think, F3 with uh, Prema. So we were teammates just in different categories back then. Uh, yeah, he's a great driver and I obviously wish him the best. Uh, and in terms of Mercedes, uh, now I'm a Mercedes junior driver for the second year. Uh, this year in Formula 2, uh, I will say I've gained a lot more experience in the past year uh, with Mercedes. I'm spending a lot of time in the F1 simulator. Uh, I now live in the UK to be closer to Mercedes. Uh, started to do the race support in the city as well and uh, working out in the gym with the engineers and drivers. Uh, so it's it's just a good opportunity. They give um, some good help. Uh, obviously, the branding as well is hugely important in terms of finding sponsors. Uh, I'm in a situation where my full budget is covered by sponsors, and it's an incredible hard work for my don- my manager, Dora Rees Messen, and myself. Uh, so being part of the Mercedes program is is definitely a, a key factor for that as well. So you think it's something that Paul will benefit from as well, just in terms of getting sponsor visibility to make that step up, presumably to FIA F3 next year? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he it's benefiting him as well. And if he can do a good job this year, I see no reason why he wouldn't be there next year.
Now, as much as we could ask questions all day, F1 Feeder Series isn't for us, it's for you, and we want to make sure you all feel involved. So we're moving on to the part of the podcast where our viewers and listeners have their say with hashtag AskF1FS. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and asking whatever it is that's on your mind. Got a lot of questions. (laughs) <laughs> so sorry Tyler you might need to go for a little snooze here because PLC and Fred are very popular popular drivers we've got first question here for you Pierre and this is from Percy Wolf. and what they ask what is the advice you give to Hamda to help her progress is it mental training physical coaching driving tips how do you help her yeah it's more about driving tips and um, also racecraft you know, advices. Um, yeah, it's more about that. Then she has, a, um, let's say, physical coach. So I'm not taking care of uh, of this. But uh, yeah, it's more on the technical aspects of uh, of, uh, of the drive. Simple stuff. Uh, this one's from Jonah KV uh, to you, Fred. Are you good friends with the other Scandinavians in F1, F2, F3, Magnussen, Hauger, Rasmussen, etc.? <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. You know, we we all we all talk, but I don't know if we can. I don't know for sure. We we all talk sometimes. Uh, I know Rasmussen actually for a long time. Uh, it's a bit of a funny story because uh, Oliver, I, I I had no idea he even existed, uh, and then all of a sudden I just saw him in uh, in Italian F4, another Danish guy speaking Danish, and I was just amazed. And uh, ever since then we've been talking. Because uh, obviously he lives in south of France um, and he's always been, I think. So I've never really heard about him in Denmark. But then all of a sudden he just popped up in Italian F4 while I was there. And uh, yeah, so I definitely speak a lot to him. And uh, and yes, I also speak to, to the others. Why do you think, this is a bit of a follow-up question on my side, and I've asked a few Scandinavian drivers this, that there's not a lot of you in terms of a global population, but there's a shit ton of you <laughs> in motor racing. Why is that? I I actually don't know, but it's actually a really good question. It's something in Denmark we talk a lot about because we are 5.5 million people in Denmark, but we actually have a huge amount of good racing drivers and professional racing drivers around the world. And uh, I, I really think it comes down to to like the development of young drivers in Denmark. There is a, quite a big program, to be honest, that I have been a part of since I was 10 years old. And that was including Christian Lungard, myself, uh, Christian Rasmussen, um, a lot of other drivers who now is racing or is doing something within racing and I just remember we were going like once a month uh, to train together we had a, a coach on the program and um, there was financial support you know there's like a foundation in Denmark that just helps um, that's that's from Denmark's side I'm not sure in, in Norway or Sweden um, but they're definitely doing a good job to help young drivers really are there's a lot of you coming through um let's move on to this question it's actually to to both of our drivers here but let's go with you in particular and first pierre daniel masek has asked have you considered the american racing ladder with indycar indy lights indy pro 2000 as an alternative career path yeah it's a possibility we see that uh, christian lungard is uh, is moving up there and uh, for the for the moment, he's doing well. So um, yeah, I think you can become professional there. Uh, there are some good sponsors, good uh, good drivers, and uh, the championship seems to be interesting. So yeah, uh, there are some possibilities, of course. Is it something you've actually explored at all in any serious sense? For the moment, in any serious sense no but uh but uh, maybe we'll think about it in the in the near future yes yeah, a lot of drivers have gone over there and done pretty well fred anything that you've considered with going over to america well my full focus is uh, reaching formula one uh, and that would obviously be a plan b uh, which i don't have which is clear for me <laughs> uh, i want to become world champion in f1 and uh, that's what i i do to try to achieve every single day um, so Looking ahead in the future, I don't really look at uh, USA, uh, but obviously if things doesn't go as planned, it's definitely a good opportunity. Uh, I think IndyCar is, is, is a really good series and has become something very special as well. Um, and obviously if you look at the drivers there, 
it's a very strong field. Yeah, it's not really the conventional route. And I think, what is it, Jacques Villeneuve's route of going from um, America then to Formula One to be world champion isn't really a road explored much these days. Let's move on to this question from Alexei J15. Apologies on the pronunciation there. This one's for you, Pierre. We all know in terms of pace, you should have a seat in FIA F3, but missed out due to a lack of funding. Do you believe the system is fundamentally flawed and what do you think can be changed in the future? Oh, I think it's uh, part of motorsports. We know, everyone knows uh, about that uh, since we are quite young. Um, but it's, uh, let's say, a tricky period to, to find some, uh, some sponsors, especially in France. Um, so that's why for the moment uh, it's quite difficult I know that Victor for example is helped by the French Federation and Alpine of course um, and he has maybe one or two more sponsors uh, thanks to the attraction of the brand of Alpine let's say but uh, from my side it's uh, a bit difficult um, in the future I, I don't really know let's say how it can change it can change um, I think uh, the drivers just need to to find uh, their own way and uh, some sponsors like Fred is doing too. Yeah, I'd love to follow up on that. We have just so many questions. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to this one. But funnily enough, you might actually say something similar, Fred, because this one comes from Sarah, who wants to know if you could change one thing in motorsport, what would it be? Yeah, I think it's... It's it's difficult to to put it that way because we we are racing around the world, all around the world. Um, we have in F two, uh, I have only on my car six people allocated the whole year. We run every, we run new tires every single session. The cars are very expensive. We have flights. You know, it's it's a huge um, it's a huge budget to run Formula Two and even any race car. It just costs a lot of money, and to reduce that cost would be the perfect for for guys like me who doesn't have the budget personally to to bring. Um, but at the same time, it's just not possible to make it you know cheap. Um, but I think it's really important that we all work really hard to to make motorsport even more visible for sponsors, and and in that way we can bring bring the sponsorships. Um, I've worked, I remember when I was 12, I was doing my first uh, presentation of my project in front of uh, 10 businessmen from my city. Um, and, and, you know, that's the way I found my first sponsor. And then he knew someone who also wanted in the future to sponsor me. And, you know, like that, you build a network. Um, and that's the way I've done it. And it's incredibly hard work. So going on the question, though, it sounds like just making things more accessible is uh, the dream that you'd like yeah, to, to change. Yeah, I think just to, to, to put it in a simple way to make it more visible and accessible for any young driver who have talent. I think we can all uh, drink to that. This question comes from a um, regular question asker. It is Verstappening. They want to know, Pierre, what was your reaction to your exit in F3 and will we see you in a single-seater series in the future? Yeah, of course, uh, I was really disappointed because, uh, like Fred said, uh, I did a bit the same. At 12, I was already uh, looking for sponsors, uh, you know, presenting my project on a computer to, uh, let's say, to several um, and company owners and uh, like that I've built a network and unfortunately during the COVID period uh, two of them let's say uh, fell down and I had to stop so I was really disappointed about that but uh, I'm trying hard to come back in into single seater in the near future yeah. Now one of the questions that comes as a follow-up I suppose comes from uh OP7407, a.k.a. Big If True, via Discord. And they want to know, PLC, what were your goals for the 2021 F3 season? Do you have any anything specific in mind? Well, it, will, it would have been my first season, let's say, uh, with the answer. So my target was to do at least the top 12 uh, to reach uh, two, three podiums. That was the target, uh, let's say, to, to, to take experience and then move forward into a, a better, let's say, a top team 
like ART or Prema or high tech are doing well also this year. So, yeah. Well, wasn't to be, unfortunately, maybe in the future. Fred, this question from Sabotici. They want to know how much harder it is to drive an F2 car compared to the F3 car. I will say it's a lot harder and it's a lot harder than it looks. Um, <laughs> jumping from Formula 3 to Formula 2, uh, I expected, I would say I expected less uh, of a difference that there actually is. Um, so it's the same engine, but the F2 has a big turbo to, to make the extra horsepower. And that turbo just makes life difficult. Um, it has a big turbo lag and it's very tricky. Um, the F2 car has 650 horsepower. is a lot of weight also. Um, and especially in the race runs, it's a handful to drive. Um, but at the same time, it's really, really good because it also means that if you get it right and if you start feeling confident and start to understand how to drive the car, you can actually make a really good difference. Um, I would say Formula 3 is on rails all the time, quality or race. The Formula 2 car needs a lot more work and adjusting on the brake bias, on driving style, talking to the team all the time, trying to maximize every little bit of it. Um, so I would say it's definitely easier in F3 to jump in and, uh, and just drive. In Formula 2, it takes a bit more time. Do you think then, Fred, more time for maybe the rookies or maybe the whole field doing preseason testing could help? Sure. Uh, six days or so whatever we're doing is, is not a lot. Um, it would definitely help to do more days in the car. But at the same time, that would also increase the cost of running Formula 2, which is, always, which is already too expensive, in my opinion. Um, it's very, very expensive. It's very difficult to, to make it happen for many drivers, including myself. Uh, so to bring even more driving would mean even more budget needed. So I think this is probably uh, the best situation we can be in right now, uh, even though it's not nice to have limited driving. I'm going to wake Tyler up here with a question I'm just going to throw out because what you've said there, Fred, is that the rookies probably have it a lot more difficult than the experienced drivers because they're not used to the car. Who's your, I wouldn't say top rookie, but who's the rookie that's impressed you the most so far this year, Tyler? Easy. Ayumu Owasa. Um, Vest is pretty good as well, right? I think the thing is with Fred, okay, is that Fred's someone who, because of his, um, because of how well he did last year, you hold drivers like that in a higher calibre. So when they, for example, Doohan, he's got a pole, but he, you know, he's only got, how many points has he got? He's got uh, six points. You know, he's not converting. And that's the thing. It doesn't matter how well you do in the qualifying. It needs to be converted in those races. And Awas has done that. You know, I think that, that P2 in qualifying uh, in Imola really surprised me. He was a driver who, if you look at the Red Bull drivers, uh, juniors, in terms of there's five of them, I believe, and you've got, you know, Hauger, you've got Darugula, you've got a lot of really strong guys, you know, Lawson, Vips, Vips and then Awasa. So you'd put them in that order, you know, with Awasa being in the bottom. Um, and I kind of was expecting him to struggle to get in the points to honest, this year, but he's he's been strong straight away. I know that he dipped it in the gravel, I think, in the first like seconds of qualifying or practice in Bahrain. But since then, he's been really, really strong. And um, there's a lot of uh, rookies this year. It's nearly half the field. So I think it highlights just how well he's doing. And um, it's interesting, on, just on Fred's point about the, about the car, half of the people that come from F3 seem to say that it's no difference at all. I think Sargent was saying... Um, the other week when I asked him, he said, oh, it's not that much of a big deal in terms of difference. And there's a few things here or there, but it's not that much of a jump. And then you get other drivers, you know, as Fred just said, they feel it's a big difference. I wonder, Fred, quick thing to you, just to add on to that. Does the driving style of the driver, maybe, you know, if the driver prefers, uh, prefers oversteer or understeer, that sort of thing, does that at all affect how quickly they get up to speed with the new car? Yeah, I don't think necessarily the driving style, even from F3 to F2 is much different. Um, it's it's the same thing you need to do to achieve a good lap time. I think the main difference is the, um, the like the brutality of the car. It's a lot faster. It's a lot more heavy. The races are longer. All these things just you know means that it, some people need more time and to get it right. Um, and in my case, I'm sure that in one or two races I will be in a different place than I am right now because I'm fully focused on my progress. Um, and in my case, it's really just putting that qualifying lap together. 
Um, and it's not really because the car is much different, but there's, for example, the new carbon brakes, uh, which I didn't have in Formula 3, is just so sensitive. And you do something one day in testing and it works brilliant. And I'm in the top three. And then I do it. I try to do it again the day after and it, I'm nowhere. So the, sensi the sensitivity of Formula 2 is so small uh, and the, the, the window where it's working is tiny. I think that's probably the main difference from F3 to F2. I'm just going to do a quick shout out to a driver you mentioned as well, Tyler, on the rookie side of things. I think Logan Sargent's been pretty impressive. I know we had a bit of an issue and was, I think the feature race when he slipped down the order uh, mm -hmm. this weekend, but a lot of good rookies come through. I think it's a, a solid, a solid uh, grid this year in Formula 2. Very, very fortunate to watch it from the sides. One of the drivers also mentioned there was Dennis Hauger, Pierre. Um, AS19 wants to know, do friendships with other drivers on the grid, for example, you and Hauger in 2020, make things a bit more tricky when you're out on track? I mean, we can be friends out, out of the race, basically, and still race together. Uh, I mean, we, we've been always uh, racing in a fair way. Uh, we've never uh, crashed. Uh, it was always clean. So I think we have... Uh, uh, let's say mutual uh, respect and uh, that helps a lot uh, for the race simple uh, slightly political as well I think you've, you've answered that without answering it but yeah I understand where, where you come from on it another question from AS19 and this one's a good one as well Fred you're reportedly speaking with Mercedes for three years before they accepted you into the academy how did the first contact come about well, it actually came about when I was uh, racing in Formula 4 in, German, in Germany uh, with Panama Sport Racing. Um, that was Rob, uh, the team manager. He knew Gwen Lagroy, who was running the, the program in uh, Mercedes, the junior program. And uh, I remember I got his email. And I got Gwen's email and I started sending him updates from my, my race weekends, both when it was bad and when it was good. You know, when, if you write when it's going bad, you can certainly also write when it's going well and you can, you can show your flag. And that's what I did. Um, and uh, I got the first meeting with Gwen uh, by myself without any manager or anything. Uh, I showed my face. Uh, I told him what my goals was. And uh, he told me to win a championship. Um, and uh, I did that the, the year after. And uh, we, we were still, you know, ongoing the talks. Um, and uh, after the 2020 season, uh, where I finished very strong uh, in F3, I, I was in very strong contact uh, with them and, and I signed a contract for the 21 season. Just a question then for any young drivers who may be listening to this and taking notes. Were you getting replies back to those emails or were you just trying to send them and hope that they were being read? Um, I, I don't think in the beginning I got any replies, uh, but for sure at some point he started to to reply and, and, and you know, I did the pole position. I remember in uh, Hoppenheim at the F1 weekend, actually my first F1 weekend in F4, and I did the pole and the race win. And it was Toto Wolf uh, that, I, that gave me the trophy on the hmm. podium. So there was a, a small connection there. And I knew what I wanted. And it was definitely being a part of the Mercedes program. Um, and that was in 2020, uh, yeah, 2020, 2018. And now we're in 22. And, and uh, I'm a part of it, which is uh, quite an amazing story, to be honest. My dreams really can come true. This one is from Fossey King on Discord, a.k.a. Flourish Vishmon. Given that GT4 is fairly low level, are you targeting getting into GT3 in the future, Pierre? For the moment, um, I have some connections uh, also with the endurance uh, world, let's say, uh, about prototypes for LMP2, for example, maybe for an LMP2 move. So let's see, let's see how it's going now. Uh, but uh, yeah, if there is a possibility, I will move up to, to GT3, of course, because uh, I mean, GT4 is just, uh, you know, to keep racing, uh, to keep a program. But uh, of course, I want to be higher in the, in the categories. And I, I know I can fight uh, at the front, uh, even in F3 or LMP2 or, or even higher. So I, I'm working on it. Are you enjoying the GT4? Sorry? Are you enjoying the GT4 racing? 
Yeah, honestly, it was it was a nice uh, nice category. Uh, let's say that uh, the field is really tight. Also, even if the car is quite slow, uh, you have some great battles, and um, that that's really fun because, uh, I mean, in single seater, you can you never touch. You know, um, let's say door door to door, and now you can you can do it. So <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, you have to remember when you get back into a single seater not to do that, else you'll end no. up like some of those F3 drivers this weekend. We're going to run out of time, so there's a quite a few questions which I'm going to have to skip, and I do apologise for viewers and listeners who have sent those in. But there are three questions I need to ask Fred before you go. Two of them are quite short, and I don't know the background behind them, so maybe you need to explain slightly. Cookie virus wants to know, do you still buy those chocolate rye things before you leave Denmark? All right, yeah. So that was the thing a few, few years ago. Um, there's this uh, bakery at the airport where I live, uh, used to live in Denmark. And I always bring, you know, my a bag of bread. Uh, it's like a chocolate break, uh, bread thing. Uh, and I always bring it for the race weekend just to have a bit of extra energy. And it just became a bit of a thing. Um, but I actually, I'm not living in Denmark anymore. Uh, so I'm actually not... I don't, I don't go there to the shop anymore. Um, so no, I don't bring them, but I can tell you every time I go to Denmark, I almost uh, visit the shop every time. So yeah, sure, I still eat them. Tyler, I think the last time you were on the podcast, we ended up talking about F1 Feed a series again. I don't know what it is with you and the food connections. Uh, wrong with that. I love my food. And <laughs> I, it, by the sounds of it, so does every driver. I mean, if you're traveling that much, and I'm sure, I'm sure you know, the guys can attest to it, that um, you end up eating the food where you stay. So I mean, is the next question going to be about food? Is that what you're asking? No, no, it just, it was, well, it's slightly tied to it. I've got a question myself now on the follow-up, though, for both PLC and Fred. Did you have some terrific Italian food uh, on your weekends in Italy? Once, once uh, I've uh, eaten uh, some fish, you know, with the uh, sauce, special sauce, and I got intoxicated, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in a hard way. And so now when I'm going to Italy, I'm only eating pasta or pizza. You know? <laughs> it's safer. And uh, no, but uh, no, no, only once. Uh, the rest of the time, it was always really good. So, How about you, Fred? Lots of pizza this weekend? Um, honestly, I went to Imola with the big expectation to have a good pizza. And I pretty much talk about it every day when I was there. <laughs> but I didn't manage to get it. Um, we were late on track every single night. Where we was eating on track most of the days, and the one time I went to the restaurant, they didn't serve pizza. So uh, I had Italy. a lot of pasta in Italy. Yeah, I can't believe it, but uh, that was the case. <laughs> but it was great food, but just no pizza. Well, I'm going to make the podcast run slightly long with a short anecdote. When I went to Italy, I turned up at the hotel really late, hotel slash restaurant, and it was probably around nine thirty. And the person said, oh, you're probably hungry. Do you want some food? We've got like a reduced menu. Gave the menu. It's like, oh, and of course, we can make pizza. Like, there's the way they said it was like the Italian person is taught this <laughs> at school or something. It's like, you get, of course, we can make pizza. I'm amazed you went to an Italian restaurant without pizza options. Uh, yep. To answer what you said, Tyler, it's not directly tied to food, but Amber wants to know, does Fred know how to pronounce shrimp and waffles by now? Yeah, so that's another thing. That's actually from the Prima days. Uh, you okay. know, Prima is doing all these uh, videos mm. uh, on YouTube and it's really funny to do. But um, yeah, there was a video where I was asking Oscar something about a shrimp. Uh, and I still don't know if I'm saying it correctly. So whatever, now I'm just calling it uh, like a prawn because uh, <laughs> Oscar told me that. So yeah, it's uh, I still don't know. And a uh, waffle, I still don't know if it's correct, but... I just say it the way I believe is right. Say it, say it again. Waffle. I don't see the problem with that. Waffle, no, waffle, maybe I've Waffle Van Dorn. I'm, sure, I'm probably improved, but uh, yeah, it's uh, just good. Uh, back to the good perma days and uh, all the <laughs> videos we did. <laughs> Last question um, comes from No Road Management, aka Nines via Discord. Are you familiar with the ART second seat curse meme? And do you believe it holds any truth or is it pure, purely speculative conjecture? Well, I, I've uh, seen a lot of comments and it's funny because every time I do well, in, 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 like for example, this weekend in Imola, 
everyone was like, yeah, they were really hyped and you need a good team to perform. And, they, and then suddenly if it doesn't go well, you know, there's a lot of people on the internet, obviously with the history uh, that AIT have had in the past seasons where one driver seems to be struggling a bit more than the other. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, are definitely thinking about that. But I can confirm that it's not true. And uh, I am working on myself all the time. I have a great teammate in Theo Pusher, and uh, I'm pushing maximum to 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 improve and beat him. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, it's easy, you know, to to speculate about stuff like that. But uh, when you when you are in it and working hard, you know what's going on, and it's a lot of hard work to to achieve what we want. So just to confirm, when you turn up to the factory, the team don't go. Here's the good car. Here's a cursed car. This is yours. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> of course not. And why would the team do that? And why would the team do that? They have uh, two cars. They have the goal to become champion. There's absolutely no reason uh, whatsoever uh, for that to be true. So I'm 100% confident in my team and, uh, and in my car. I'm not sure if Twitter are going to believe you, but I do. And at the moment, actually, you need a bit of a shout out to ART. Two points off MP Motorsport at the second place in the championship at the moment. The championship's amazing. And in F2, MP62, ART60, High Tech 60, Carlin 53, Kramer 50. Wow. It's a terrific, terrific championship. But we've run out of time, unfortunately. Thank you, all of you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. That's all the time we have this week. If you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, use the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord look for the podcast questions channel. If you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us. And if you are listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out f1feederseries.com for more feeder series insight, including Tyler's work for any F2 content and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas and F1 FS Live on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those, plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Ciao.